All right, so this is our 10th PowerPoint of the series, and this is the literature of Leo Tolsky. You're gonna remember some of the stories he wrote as soon as I tell you who he is. So stay tuned. He was born September 9th, 1828. Yanzia Pollyanna, Russia. He died November 20th, 1910. Lev Tolsky, Russia. Spouse, Sophia Toshime. 1862 to 1910, children, Alexei Lovish Tolsky, Andre Voshke, Tolsky and more. Movies, War and Peace, Anna Karina. So according to Britannica on Leo Tolsky, Leo Tolsky, Tolsky was spelled Tolsky, so, Russian in full, Lev Novoshes Graf Count Tosky. Born August 28th, September 9th, New Style, 1828, Yajna Palyana, Tola Provenance, Russian Empire died November 7th, November 20th, 1910, Astropov, Ryan in Providence, Russian author, a master of realistic fiction, and one of the world's greatest novelists. Today, Tolsky is known for his two longest works, War and Peace, 1865 to 69, and Anna Karina, 1875 to 77, which are commonly regarded as among the finest novels ever written. Why I mentioned that you probably remember him is War and Peace is a very popular book and also became a movie. War and Peace is particular, seems virtually to define this form in many readers and critics. Among Tolsky's shorter works, The Death of Ivan Lunch, that's also a well-known one, also made into a movie, 1886, is usually classed among the best examples of novella. Especially during the last three decades, Tolsky was achieved world renowned as a moral and religious teacher. His doctrine of non-resistance to evil had an important influence on Gandhi. Although Tosky's religious ideas no longer command the respect they once did, interest in his life and personality has, if anything, increased over the years. Most of the readers agree with the assessment of the 19th century British poet and critic Matthew Arnold that a novel by Tolsky is not a work of art, but a piece of life. The Russian author Isaac Babel comments that if the world could write by itself, it would write like Tolsky. Critics of diverse schools have agreed, but somehow Tolsky's work seemed to elude all artifice. Most have stressed his ability to observe the smallest changes of consciousness and record the slightest movements of the body. What another novelist would describe as a single act of consciousness, Tolsky convincingly breaks down into the series of infinitely small steps. According to the English writer Virginia Woolf, who took it for granted Tolsky was the greatest of all novelists, these observable powers elicited a kind of fear in readers who wish to escape the gaze which Tolsky fixes on them. Those who reported Tolsky as an old man who reported feelings of great discomfort when he appeared to understand their unspoken thoughts. It was commonplace to describe him as a godlike in his powers and titanic in his struggles to escape the limitations of human condition. Some viewed Polsky as embodiment of the nature and pure validity. Others saw him as incarnation of the world's conscious. But for almost all who knew him or read his works, he was just as one of the greatest writers who ever lived, but a living symbol of the search for one's life's meaning. Early years, the scion of prominent aristocrats, Tolsky was born at the family estate about 130 miles, 210 kilometers south of Moscow, where he was to live the better part of his life and write the most important works. His mother, Mary Noshkovy, ni princess uh, Roskovaya, died before he was two years old, and his father, Nikolay Inrich Gov Count Tolsky, followed her in 1836-7. His grandmother died 11 months later, and his next guardian aunt, Alice Grant, Alexandra, in 
1841, Tolsky and his four siblings were then transferred to the care of another aunt, Kazan in Western Russia. Tolsky remembered a cousin who lived in Yashna Palina, Kariana, Alex Drovia, Yershan, Aunt Tonet, as he called her as the greatest influence of his childhood. And later, as a young man, Tolsky wrote some of his most touching letters to her. Despite the consultant present of death, Tolsky remembered his childhood in idyllic terms. His first published work, Destavo, 1852, Childhood, was a fictional and knowledgeistic account of his early years. Educated at home by tutors, Tolsky enrolled in University of Kansan in 1844 as a student of Oriental languages. His poor records soon forced him to transfer to a less demanding law faculty where he wrote a comparison of the French political philosopher Mosquit, the spirit of the laws in Catherine the Great, Nazir, instructions for law code. Interested in literature and ethics, he was drawn by the works of English novelists, Lauren Stern and Charles Dickens, and especially to the writings of the French philosopher, Jean Jacques Rousteau in place of a cross, he wore a medallion, with the portrait of Rousseau, but he spent most of his time trying to be a Kamad el Fat, socially correct, drinking, gambling, and engaging in democracy. After leaving the university in 1847 without a degree, Tolsky returned to Yaja Pollyanna, where he planned to educate himself, to manage his estate, to prove a lot of his serfs. Despite frequent resolutions to change the ways, he continued to lose life during stays at Tola, Moscow and St. Petersburg. In 1851, he joined his older brother, Nikolay, an army officer in the Cossacks and entered the army himself. He took part in campaigns against the native peoples and soon after in the Crimean War, 1853 to 56. In 1847, Tolsky began keeping a diary, which became his laboratory of for experiments in self-analysis and later for his fiction. With some interruption, Tolsky kept his diaries without his life and is therefore one of the most copious documented writers who ever lived. Reflecting the life he was leading, his first diary begins confiding what he may have contracted is a venereal disease. The early diaries report a record of fascination with rulemaking and Tolsky composed rules for diverse aspects of social and moral behavior. They also record the writer's repeated failure to honor these rules. His attempts to formulate new ones designed to ensure obedience to the old ones and his frequent acts of self castigation Tolsky later believed that life was too complex and disordered ever to conform to the rules or philosophical systems perhaps derived from these frugal attempts at self-regulation. First publication of Leo Tolsky. Consoling his identity, Tolsky submitted childhood for publication in Sorvermek, the Contemporary, a prominent journal edited by poet Nicolai Nervesk. Nervesk was enthusiastic and pseudonymously published work was widely praised. During the next few years, Tolsky published a number of stories based on his experiences in the caucus, including Nabek. 1853, The Raid, and Three Sketches About Siege of Stavenskull during the Crimean War. Sevenpol, Debray, Maste, Sevenpol in December, and Sevenpol in May, Sevenpol in May, Sevenpol 1855, Courage a Simple Soldier, was praised by the T-Star. Written in second person as if we were a tour guide, the stories all demonstrate Tolsky's keen interest informal experimentation, a long, lifelong concern with the morality of observing other people's suffering. The second sketch includes a lengthy passage of soldier's demon consciousness. One of the early uses of this device in the instant before he is killed by a bomb. In the story's famous ending, the author, after commenting none of his characters are truly heroic, asserts that he, hero of my story, whom I love with all the power of my soul, who was, is, and ever will be beautiful, is the truth. 
Readers ever since have remarked on Tolstoy's ability to make obsolete language, which usually ruins realistic fiction, aesthetically effective. After the Crimean War, Tolstoy resigned from the army and was at first nailed by a literary world of St. Petersburg, but his prickly vanity, his refusal to join an electoral camp, his instance on his complete independence soon eared him dislike the radical intelligentist. He was to remain throughout his life an anterist opposed to prevailing intellectual trends. In 1857, Tolstoy traveled to Paris and returned after gambling away his money. After his return to Russia, he decided that he has a real vocation was predatory. And he organized school for peasant children on his estate. After touring Western Europe to study pedagogical theory and practice, he published 12 issues in a journal, Eshevea Pollyanna, 1862 to 63 which included his provocative articles, Progress e Opolarni, Abrazaya, Progress with the Definition of Education, which denies that history has any underlying laws. And Komu U Congo Yusuf Hazet, Krasian Rabian, Unas Eli Nam e Brazaya Baviat. Who should learn writing of whom? Peasant children of us or we of peasant children? Which reverses the usual answer to the question. Tolsky married Sofia, Sonia, and Drevia Burz, the daughter of a prominent Moscow physician, in 1862 and soon transferred all his energies to his marriage and the composition of War and Peace. Tolsky and his wife had 13 children, of whom 10 survived infancy. Tolsky's work during the late 1850s and early 1860s experimented with new forms of expressing his moral and philosophical concerns. In childhood, he soon added Ostrachevicho, 1854, Boyhood, and Unoist, 1857, Youth. A number of stories center on a single semi autobiographical character, Demptim. Dothro, who later reappeared as a hero of Tolsky's novel, Resurrection. In Lurton, 1852, Lurserine, Tolsky uses a diary form first to relate an incident, which to reflect on his timeless meaning, and finally to reflect on the pro process of his own reflections. Try Misery, 1859. Three deaths describes the death of a nobleman who cannot face the fact that she is dying of a peasant who accepts death simply, and that last of a tree who's utterly natural in contrast with human artifice, only the author's transcendent consciousness unifies these three events. The period of the great novels, which would be 1863 to 77, happily married in, in coast with his wife and family in Yaniva, Pollyanna. Tolsky reached the height of his creative powers. He devoted the remaining years of the 1860s to writing The War and Peace. Then, after an interlude during which he considered writing a novel about Peter the Great, briefly returning to pedagogy, bringing out the reading primers were widely used. Tolsky wrote his other great novel, Anna Karina. These two works share a vision of human experience rooted in appreciation of everyday life and poetic virtues. War and Peace. Voya Emir, 1865 to 69, War and Peace contains three kinds of material, historical account of the Napoleonic Wars, the biographies of fictional characters, and a set of essays about philosophy of history. Critics from the 1860s to present have wondered why these three parts cohere, and many have faulted Tolsky, including the lengthy essays, but readers continue to respond to them with undiminished enthusiasm. The work's historical portions narrate the campaign of 1805 leading to Napoleon's victory in the Battle of Jorez, a period of peace and Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. Contrary to generally accepted views, Tolsky portrays Napoleon as an ineffective ego manager buffoon, Tsar Alexander I, 
as a phrase maker obsessed with how historians will describe him, the Russian general Marie Kozovizov, previously disparaged as a patient old man who understands limitations of human will and planning. Particularly noteworthy are the novel's battle scenes, which show combat as sheer chaos. Generals may imagine they can anticipate all contingencies, but the battle is really the result of hundreds of millions of diverse stances decided in the moment of unforeseeable circumstances in war in his life. No system or model can come close to accounting for the infinite complexity of human behavior. Among the book's fictional characters, the reader's attention is first focused on Prince Andrzej Poloski, a proud man who has come to despise everything fake, shallow, or merely conventional. Recognizing the artifice of the high society, he joins the army to achieve glory, which he regards as truly meaningful. Badly wounded and Auschwitz, he comes to see glory in Napoleon no less petty than the salons of St. Petersburg. As novel progresses, Prince Andrew repeatedly discovers the emptiness of activities in which he has devoted himself. Tolsky's description of his death in 1812 is usually regarded as one of the most effective scenes of Russian literature. The novel's other hero, bubbling and sincere, is Pierre Mezrash, oscillates between the belief of some philosophical system promising to resolve all questions and revitalism. So total as to leave him a apathetic despair, he at last discovers that Tulsi and truth, that wisdom can be found, not systems, but the ordinary process of daily life, especially his marriage to the novel's most memorable heroine, Natasha. When the book stops, it does not really end, but just breaks off and Pierre seems to be forgetting his less than enthusiasm for a new utopian plan. In accord to Tolsky's idea that prosodic everyday activities make life good or bad, the book's truly wise characters are not its intellectuals, but a simple de deceit soldier. Natasha's brother, Nicolay, and the generous, specious woman, Andre's sister, Myra, these marriage symbols, the novel central prosthetic values. The essays on War and Peace, which begin the second half of the book, sanitize all the attempts to formulate general laws of history and reject the ill-considered assumptions supporting all historical narratives. In Tolsky's view, history, like the battle, is essentially a product of conjugality. It has no direction. It fits no pattern. The cause of historical events are infinitely buried and forever unknowable. And the historical writing which claims to explain the past necessary falsifies it. The shape of historical narratives reflects not the actual course, but events, but essentially literary criteria established by earlier historical narratives. According to Tolsky's essays, historians also make a number of the closely connected errors. They presume that history is shaped by the plans and ideas of great men, whether generals or political leaders or intellects like themselves, and that his direction is determined at dramatic moments leading to major decisions. In fact, however, history is made by the sum total of infinite number of small decisions taken by ordinary people whose actions are too unremarkable to be documented. As Tolsky explains, to presume that the grand events make history is like concluding from the view of the different region where only treetops are visible, that the region contains nothing but trees. Therefore, Tolsky's novel gives its readers countless examples of small incidents that each exert a tiny influence, which is one reason that war and peace is so long. Tolsky's belief in efficiency is ordinary and quality of the system building set him in the opposition to thinkers of his day. It remains one of the most controversial aspects of his philosophy. Anna Karina, Anna Karina, 1875 to 77, Tolsky applied these ideas to family life. The novel's first sentence, which indicates its concern on domestic, is perhaps Tolsky's most famous. All happy families resemble each other. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And Anna Karima intervenes the stories of three families, the Obsies, the Karians, and the Levins. The novel begins at the Obsies, which his long-suffering wife Dolly has discovered her infidelity of her genital and sobriety husband Stevia, 
her kindness, care for her family, and concern for everyday life. Dolly stands as a novel moral compass. By contrast, Divya, through never wishing ill, wastes resources, neglects a family, and regards pleasure as the purpose of life. The figure of Stevia is perhaps designed to suggest that evil, no less than good, ultimately derives from small moral choices human beings make in the moment by moment. Stevia's sister Anna begins a novel as a faithful wife and stiff, unromantic, but otherwise distant government minister, Alaski Karin, and the mother of a young boy, Yezhova. But Anna, who imagines herself as a heroine of a romantic novel, allows her to fall in love with the officer. Aleski Roski, schooling herself to see only the worst in her husband, she eventually leaves him and her son to live with Roski. Although the novel Toski indicates is romantic idea of love, which most people identify with, love itself is entirely incapable. The superior kind of love, intimate love of good families. As novel progresses, Anna, who suffers pangs of conscience for her abandoning her husband and child develops the habit of lying to herself until she reaches a state of near madness and total separation from reality. She at last commits suicide by throwing herself under a train. The realization she may have been thinking about life incorrectly comes to her own when she's lying on the track and it's too late to save herself. The third story concerns Dolly's sister Kitty, who first imagines she loves Vronsky, but then recognizes real love is the intimate feeling she has for her family's old friend, constantly live on. Their story focused on courtship, marriage, and ordinary incidents of family life, which in spite of many difficulties, shape real happiness and meaningful existence. Throughout the novel, Levin is tormented by philosophical questions about the meaning of life and the faith of death. Although these questions are never answered, they vanish when Levin begins to live correctly by devoting himself to his family and to daily work. Like the creator Tolsky, Levan regards the systems of intellectuals as superfluous and incapable of embracing life's complexity. Both War and Peace and Anna Karini advance the idea that ethics can never be a matter of timeless rules applied to a particular situation. Rather, ethics depends on sensitivity developed over lifetime to particular people and specific situation. Tolsky preference for particularities over abstractions is often described as a hallmark of thought. Conversation and religious beliefs. Upon complete, completing Anna Karina, Tolsky fell into a profound state of eccentric despair, which he describes in his Improv 1884, My Confession. All our activities seem utterly pointless in the face of death, and Tolsky, impressed by the faith of common people, turned to religion. Drawn at first the Russian Orthodox Church, to which he had been born, he rapidly decided that it and all other Christian churches were corrupt institutions that thoroughly falsified true Christianity. Having discovered what he believed to be Christ's message and having to overcome his paralyzing fear of death, Tolsky devoted the rest of his life to developing and progressing his new faith. He was excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church in 1901. Stately positively, the Christianity of Tolsky's last decade stressed five tenets. Be not angry, do not lust, do not take oaths, do not resist e devil, and love your enemies. Non-resistance to evil, the doctrine that inspired Gandhi meant not that evil must be accepted, but only that it cannot be fought with evil means, especially violence. Therefore, Tolsky became a pacifist. Because governments rely on the threat of violence to enforce their laws, Tolsky also became a kind of antichrist. Enjoyed his followers not only to refuse military service, but also to abstain from voting or having recourse to the courts. He therefore had to go through considerable inner conflict when it came time to make his will or use royalties secured by copyright, even for good works in general. It may be that Tolsky was well aware that he did not succeed in living according to his teachings. Tolsky based his prescription against oaths, including promises, and the idea adapted from his early work. The impossibility of knowing the future and therefore the danger of binding oneself in advance, the commandment against lust eventually led him to propose, as afterward, a Santa, 
1891, the Krishna Santa, a dark novella about a man who murders his wife. Total abstinence is an ideal. His wife really concerned about their strained relations objective. And to Phineas, most extreme ideas, Tolsky compared Christianity to a lamp that's not stationary, but is carried along human prayings. It lights up ever new moral realms and relieves ever high ideals as mankind progresses spiritually. Fiction after 1880 of Leo Tolsky. Tolsky's fiction after Anna Karina may have been divided by two groups. He wrote a number of moral tales for common people, including the guide Lavas Tan I Bog, written in 1885, Where Love Is, God Is, Chem Luisas, written in 1882, What People I Live By, and How Much Land Does a Man Need, a story about an Irish novelist James Joyce, rather extravagantly praised as the greatest story of the literature of the world knows. For educated people, Tolsky wrote fiction that was both realistic and highly dialectic. Some of these works succeeded brilliantly, especially Emirate Anava Lynch, written in 1886, The Death of Ivan Lynch, a novella describing a man's gradual realization he's dying and his life has been wasted on trivialities. Then we have Father Sergis, may have been taken as selfish self-critic. Critique tells the story of a proud man who wants to become a saint, but discovers that sainthood cannot be consciously sought. Regarded as great holy man, Sergis seems to realize his reputation is godlessness. Warned by a dream, he escapes incognito to seek out a simple and decent woman whom he had known as a child. At last, he learns that not he, but she is a saint and that sainthood cannot be achieved by intimidating a motto and that true saints are ordinary people unaware of their own prosodic goodness. The story therefore seems to criticize the ideas Tolsky has found after his conversation from the perspective of his earlier great novels. There he is. In 1899, Tolsky published his third novel, this is called Resurrection. He used the royalties to pay for the transportation of the persecuted religious sect, the Dolkobars, to Canada. The novel hero, idol, aristocrat, Dimitri, Novj, finds himself on a jury where he recognizes the defendant, the prostitute of Dajana Mozova, a woman whom he once seduced thus precipitating her life of crime and she contained her imprisonment in Serbia. He decides to follow her and if she will agree to marry her. After she is condemned to imprisonment in Siberia, he decides to follow her and if she will agree to marry her. In the novel's most remarkable exchange, she approaches him for his hypocrisy. Once you got your pleasure from me and now you want to get your salvation from me, she tells him she refuses to marry him. But in the novel ends, Thomas achieves a spiritual awakening. And when he at last understands Tobolkian truth, especially the fertility of judging others, the novel's most celebrated sections satirize the church and the justice system, but the work is generally regarded as marked inferior to War and Peace and Anna Karenia. Tolsky's conversation led him to the trees and several essays on art. Sometimes he expressed the more extreme forms of ideas he had always held, such as his dislike for limitation of fashionable schools, but other times he endorsed ideas that were incompatible to his own earlier novels, which he rejected. In the What is Art, he argued that true art requires a sensitive appreciation of a particular expertise, a highly specific feeling that is communicated to a reader, not by proposition, but by infection. In Tolsky's view, most celebrated works of high art derive from no real experience, but rather from clever imitation of existing art. They are therefore counterfeit works that are not really art at all. Tolsky's farther divides true art into good and bad, depending on the moral sensibility 
in which his given work infects its audience, condemning most acknowledged masterpieces, including William Shakespeare's plays, as well as his own great novels, is either counterfeit or bad, and Tolsky singled out a praise for a biblical story of Joseph and among Russian works, Floyd or Dvalsky's The House of the Dead in 1861 to 62, and some stories by his young friend Anton Shovak. He's cool to Shovak's drama, however, and celebrated wittyism, once told Shovak that his plays were even worse than Shakespeare's. Tolsky's later work includes a satiric drama called The Living Corpse, written in 1900, and a heroine play about a pleasant life. Uh, the Power of Darkness, written in 1886. After death and a number of unpublished works became light, most notably the novella called Hejad Murad in 1904, a brilliant narrative about the caucus remnant of Tolsky's earliest fiction. In the last years, with notable exception of his daughter, Alexandra, whom he made his heir, Tolsky family remained aloof from or hostile of his teaching. His wife especially resented the constant presence of disciplines led by the dogmatic V.G. Sertava at Ashna Pollyanna. Their once happy life turned into one of the most famous bad marriages in literary history. The story of his dogmatism and her penitent for scenes has excited numerous biographies to take one side over the other. And because both kept diaries and indeed exchanged and committed to each other's diaries, their quarrels are almost too well documented. Here is a picture of him with some children. Formatted by domestic situation and the contradiction between life and his principles. In 1910, Tolsky at last escaped incognito from Kaje Pollyanna, accompanied by Alexandra and his doctor. And despite of the stealth, desired privacy, the international press was soon able to report on his movements. Within days, he contracted pneumonia and died of heart failure at the railroad station in Astropo. To contrast of the other psychological writers, such as Dolsky, who specialized in unconscious processes, Dolsky described conscious mental life with unparalleled mastery. His name has become synonymous with appreciation of contingency and of the value of other activity. Oscillating between skepticism and dogmatism, Scalzi explored the most diverse approaches to human experience. Above all, his greatest works, War and Peace and Anna Karina, endure the summit of the realist fiction. Thank you so much. And that concludes our PowerPoints. Have a wonderful day. And that's our last PowerPoint for this series.